This week, we bring back Security Deathmatch and discuss some technical tips, industry trends, and privacy issues. Stories of the week, we will talk about Venom, the latest name vulnerability to strike virtualized platforms. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. Do it again. Four more times. I'll get it. This segment is sponsored by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit sans.org to learn more. Also, check out Paul and John's new SANS class, SANS 550 Active Defense, Offensive Countermeasures, and Cyber Deception. This segment also brought to you by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center's CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Visit Tenable.com for more information. Now fire up a pack of capture, pour yourself a beer, and give the intern control of your botnet. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, broadcasting from the slightly modified set here in G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. It's, of course, wonderful to be here for episode 418, live on the set with not Kevin, who's going to do the cheers again, Kevin. We're drinking some cocktails. We're here on set. Very, uh, Very excited about tonight's show. Very excited. Um, I want to introduce some of our other hosts who've joined us remotely via Skype. Mr. Michael Santarcangelo himself. Oh, you got it right. You know, we have, Mike, we have Cangelo. It's in the refrigerator. Have you I'm, tried it yet? Yeah, I'm going to have one of the production staff members go grab the, it's a, it's kind of, it's not in a can, it's in a plastic container. But it is, they are, in fact, Michael Santarcan Jello shots. It consists of Jack Daniels uh, green jello, apparently. And yeah. uh, do we have like a, a spoon or something over there? And, uh, or, or a knife? Well, no, because it, it hardened. See, it, it, it got all liquidy and then it hardened. And then, so there's mint and lots of Jack Daniels in this. So we're going to. Carlos is with us, too. Welcome, Carlos, to the show. <laughs> Hey, Paul. Carlos, Happy to be here. You don't have an official cocktail from our good friend Apollo yet, but it's uh, it's nice to have you on the show. Yeah. It's been a while, my friend. How you been? Been good. Been good. Yeah. Only been two weeks. Feels like forever, man. Are you uh, involved with B-Sides Puerto Rico? Yep. I'm one of the organizers. Nice. When is that yeah. taking place? Uh, at the end of this month. Nice. Nice. That's a fabulous place to have a B-Sides. Yeah, we're going to have uh, naked pictures of Dave Kennedy as a baby. Nice. <laughs> That's something to look forward to at a conference, I suppose. Yeah, his dad is going to do the unveiling at B-Sides Puerto Rico. That's, um, you know, that's yet another reason to visit Puerto Rico, to see so naked been, pictures of Dave Kennedy. He's been hacking naked for a long time is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's very true. He might have set the trend. So I'm going to take a Michael Santar Cangelo like shot. Drum roll, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. Mm, that's so good. Well, you have to come up here to the studio, Mike, and, and try some. I'm looking it forward feels, to it, man. The mouthfeel is strange. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, it's very um, it feels in my mouth like nothing has ever felt in my mouth before. Like Take from that what you will. Yeah, you can go a lot of places yeah. with that. You could go a lot of places with that. Those are fantastic. Aren't those really good? Lots of Jack Daniels and mint was the key. Um, a couple of quick announcements before we get into it. Ready to learn combat firmware analysis? That's right. You can register for my Black Hat course. Embedded device security assessments for the rest of us. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT. I think you have until the end of the month or... In the next couple of weeks, the price goes up. So if you're going to register for the class, 
do it freaking soon. It's going to be an awesome class. We're going to talk about firmware, embedded devices, how to assess embedded devices when you're on a penetration test, whether you're doing a vulnerability assessment, how to quickly assess those embedded systems, reverse engineer firmware. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've got lots of new stuff we'll be unveiling in the class, so you definitely want to come take my class with me because you get to hang out with me in Vegas for a couple of days and do, maybe we'll do a field trip. Who knows? Uh, so go, again, securityweekly.com forward slash IOT. Also, don't forget to register for Source Boston coming up on May 25th through the 28th. Um, we just sent an email out to our list about Source Boston. That is a fantastic conference coming up. We're going to be there. We're going to be selling Hack Naked t-shirts. We're going to be giving out Hack Naked stickers. And maybe if you can do the secret handshake or tell us the secret code, which I guess is cigars, Ask Grabby Grabby is the secret code. So if you come to our table, if you give us the secret handshake and you give us the code <laughs> Ask Grabby Grabby, we'll be selling cigars. That's right. Shh, shh, cigars. Cigars. It's all on the up and up. But uh, we will have cigars for sale at the booth at Source. So that will be fantastic. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, Security Weekly listeners get a $100 off code, which I sent to the... Security Weekly Insider List. So if you belong to the Security Weekly Insider List, you will see a discount code for $100 off. If I can find that, I will, I will, I will give it out on the show as well. All right. Are you guys ready for this? Your discount code will be SWP2015 GA. So that's SWP 2015 GA is your discount code for $100 off of Source Conference. So make sure you register and go to the conference. Dave Kennedy is going to be one of the keynote speakers. I don't think he'll be naked at that conference, though. Uh, Mike Murray is also going, who they've both been on the show. Mike Murray will be there keynoting as well. Fantastic conference. The training is the 25th and 26th. There's training from Tim Tomes on web application pen testing. There is training on a crash course for cybersecurity first responders. I believe that's Sherry Davidoff's class, who we've seen on the show before as well, uh, and a couple of other <coughs> excuse me, training classes out there. So make sure you go to sourceconference.com. That's Boston 2015. It's going to be fabulous. All righty. So... Uh, also, the first 10 people that print out that email from the email list, this is why it pays to be on an email list, first 10 people to show us that they received that email will receive a free Hack Naked shirt. Bonus. How can you go wrong? All righty. Are we ready? I, I call this security deathmatch. I don't know if it's going to be more like a deathmatch or not, but um, we're going to talk about some topics. That's really... And then, then maybe we're gonna, we then should have... fight about them? Is yeah. That, is that the next step? Yes. Maybe we should have called it Hot Topics. Hot Topics. Hot Topics. <laughs> That's the conference that Mike was at. And With you Jack? got sick, Mike, which sucks. Jack was there? Yeah, but nobody knows I got sick. I, I managed to pull it off. They do now, but... They do now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, secret, my secret's out. <laughs> so, um, you, you want to start with the... Let's start with the technical topic <clears throat> in our security death match. I want to talk about what's your most favorite tool or technique you've been using recently. Carlos, I'm going to put you on the spot because <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. I need to take a drink. <laughs> 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 Do you have a favorite technique? A hacking technique, not like an embed technique. But you have a favorite technique that you've been using lately? Uh, that's a good one. Um... So right now, I would say playing with a possible future release of an interpreter extension that I'm using to query the extended event logs and kind of find out what people are actually looking for and what type of audit they have enabled in a box before doing anything else so I don't get caught. I've been uh, helping out a couple of friends there have been in a couple of engagements where actually the customer does know their shit and have their environment pretty locked down and uh, initial times they got caught very easily and now we're playing against 
uh, very good people, so they had to up their game, and I started helping them out with getting stuff running out of memory and making sure that they know what they can do and what they cannot do on a box before they actually kind of proceed like everybody should do, but sadly, since a lot of people out there don't enable the basic stuff, we can get away with uh, simple stuff. So does your interpreter script help them evade the logging that people have enabled? Uh, uh, r right now, the way I have it is uh, I wrote it in C++. It calls uh, the audit API so I can see what is uh, what is being audited in the box. Oh, so I see. I know, I, I know what type of audit is enabled from memory. So I'm not executing any commands. I'm looking for app locker events. I'm looking for process monitoring. I'm looking for sysmon. I'm looking for all of those extended event locks that you cannot reach with the simple standard API and kind of look through the event lock for those types of events. Uh, in addition, uh, that's, there are two sections. One is for the extended event locks and the other one's for auditing. And we kind of case the, uh, the box first. What is enabled, what they're looking for, are they doing event lock chipping uh, before we do anything else on that box. That's really cool. <clears throat> I can't top. Yeah, well, I can't top that. Well, well, <laughs> just once, put us all to shame, Carlos. Well, <laughs> all right, that was a good once, section. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Once you're playing with with a group of when you have a blue team that actually works with their red team, and they get briefings and the blue team starts getting better and better, red team needs to up their game, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> so um, I know we had Michael Goff on the show, Carlos, and he talked about. Enabling certain event uh, triggers and event logging in Windows to detect indicators of compromise. It sounds like more and more people are doing that, which makes me excited for the defenders. Um, not uh, the way I see it is only those that actually do work with their red teams. Mm. When you have a customer that goes like, "No, nope, no, dude, it's PCI. I just need the checkbox. Just <laughs> tell me. I got a, I, I got a pen test done, and that's all I need." That won't work with them. But it's those that actually sit down with you and go like, okay, what did you did this day? Oh, we saw this. Oh, we didn't see this. Oh, exactly what you can you show me? When you have those customers that are actually engaging with, with you in constructive dialogue, that's awesome. Yeah, I've exactly always I've always that's thought of the pen test as um, very much a collaborative effort, as you described, Carlos. And I, it, there's so much more value that you can get from it when it's like that. Yep. Uh, I would say, what a, you know, my, my tips is uh, I love Python. It comes in handy so much. It really does. Uh, I've been doing a lot of parsing. Um, and just Python is just such an awesome, awesome tool for that. Um, the, the libraries that it uses for uh, XML parsing and things like that, URL parse, parsing web pages, XML files, it just comes in handy. It's one of those things like shell scripting has reached its limit. And while there's a good amount of possibilities there, and when you start getting into the parsing, you've got to move to mm. some other kind of scripting language. And uh, for me, that's certainly been been Python, so it's been a lot of fun. It's interesting, there was a Python project that I worked on that John Strand just released a video about, and that's the Honey Ports. It's that one that listens on a port. It does that cross-platform, listens on a port. When it receives a full connection, it writes a firewall rule, and there's different sections for Linux and Windows and OS X. And I just started playing around with ADHD a couple days ago. <coughs> yeah, so it that was my, I wrote it in class when, with John. It was pretty fun. It's a lot of fun. If you haven't checked it out, definitely check out ADHD. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about... Well, uh, actually, oh, go can ahead, we stay Mike. on that topic? Because, I mean, here's, here's yeah. where I look at stuff. The first thing that popped in my head when I read that question was, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Right? I mean, like, you're, if we just keep it really simple, if your favorite tool is a hammer, then everything ends up looking like a nail. And, and as we get more mature in the profession, the question should be, what's the right tool to apply to the job? So, you know, one of the questions that I would have, especially for you guys, is what's a tool, keep it into something maybe that's open source or low cost, that you think is a pretty good utility tool that a lot of people maybe should get some experience with even if they don't have that experience today? 
something like that, right? So, so instead of saying what's the best, what's your favorite, what's something you go to, maybe it is something that you guys go to. Is there is there a tool in your bag? I mean, if, if you've ever had uh, somebody come to your house to fix something, you always, at least I'm the kind of person who's like, hey, man, I, I'm not trying to pay attention to what you're doing because I don't trust you. I'm actually just trying to learn. And they always have some nifty tool in their bag. You're like, what is that? And they're like, oh, yeah, I got this from an old timer. They didn't interview about it. And it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> And you learn those types of things. So if somebody's listening to this now, right? Maybe they've maybe they've crossed over. They're in management. They haven't really been hands-on keyboard in a while, or there's somebody who's trying to come up in in the ranks. What's something you think everybody today should be somewhat familiar with? That's not uh, that's not too not too far afield. What would you tell them? I, learn I'm, development. <clears throat> learn to program. Because so what, what would what, what would be once something you simpler? Learn to program, <laughs> dude, you can uh, you can choose any tool you want from your rational. And adapt it from what you need. You need you need to do something in Bash. You grab Bash. You need something in Python because Python has a library. You want to talk to that service. You grab Python. No, I want to do it in PowerShell. Now I can grab PowerShell and do what I need. Well, how long? How all right? So so basic. Learn the program. Somebody who says, oh, I think I had a programming course in college. Maybe. What 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 kind of investment are, are they looking at? In time. I don't worry about the money on this one. How much time for them to learn how to program something rudimentary? Um. Given the amount of tutorials that are out there in the web right now, and most of them are free, Python. I would say you only have to put a couple of hours a day. Yeah, Python uh, has tons of free training classes, right, on the online, Carlos? Yep. Yeah, Python does, Ruby does, uh, PowerShell does. Uh, you can grab my class at DerbyCon. There's still some slots open. There you go. Um, <laughs> you, hey, it, I retweeted that today. Oh, cool. And it's PowerSploit and PowerVail uh, approved and backed. I was talking to the developers, and they're excited. Um, but but once you know, uh, you go, let, let me put it another way. First, grab a, a, a simple task that you do frequently. Uh, for for me, it is DNS enumeration. You okay. would be surprised how many times I've rewritten my tool DNS recon in so many freaking languages: hmm. C Sharp, Java. Bash, Python, Ruby, because I, I, I need to have a problem I need to solve to apply the coding of that language so I can learn it. So I can learn its idiosyncrasies and all of the syntax and, uh, and, and standard calls and everything. So typically what I do is I start with a problem. For me, it is enumeration. Let me start with doing a port scan. How do I do a port scan? Ping scan. All right. Arp scan. So I like this. I'm I'm gonna yeah. I'm just gonna cut you off for a second to make sure I'm following. So so we pick something simple like a port scan, and then we mm -hmm. go figure out how to code it. So what? Somebody who's got no not a lot of experience coding, what, what language would you tell them to start with? Bash. Paul said Python. You'd say Bash. Not Kevin. What do you say? I'm a Bash kid. Okay. Bash Bash Python, and. And is port enumeration, is that a good first project? I would say yes. yes. Well, uh, for because, someone who, especially who's gone up the chain and hasn't been behind a keyboard for a while and then trying to get back into it, knowing the battlefield you're going to be working in, in asset discovery is, is a great first place because mm. it gives you the topology and, and port scanning gives you more in-depth of what's going on. The tool, yeah, and you know what? Because that's interesting. The tool that I'm uh, going to name, which might surprise some people, is along those lines of enumeration and discovery. Yeah. All I was going to say is, you know, what's interesting, too, is I, I obviously spend a lot of time working on, on the leadership side of stuff. But lately, I, I've been doing a lot more working with students, both high school and college kids, and they keep saying the same thing to me. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting is some of the leaders that I've talked to have said, you know, Michael, uh, we're getting kids now from college that are book smart. They've never run any of these tools. They've never done any of these things so that so they have no practical experience. They, they've read about it. They've heard about it. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested now to say, all right, well, what are the things they should do? So, all right, so this sounds like a pretty good project. Well, and I guess in the spirit of security deathmatch, I disagree with Carlos and Kevin <laughs> about, uh, like, I say yeah. learn Python first. I think you need to learn a more structured language, a more in-depth language uh, in Python. Then when you go do Bash, I think the concepts will come much easier for you. But, but, but Understand Paul, programming you, first. You, you come from Perl. You, you already have PTSD and all of that associated. I did. I, I, did. I have written some Perl scripts in my time, but I actually got my start writing. Well, if you go all the way back, I was writing basic, and then I did C as well. Um, 
So I, I have more I'll programming be up front. experience. That's than where I, I left really my met. programming. I was like, you know, I was I was a kid, right? This late eighties and. If you guys remember, because um, I grew up in the Northeast too, we used to have. The, do you remember the Hoyts movie theaters? And they had like the two lasers come across the screen that would blow up. I figured out how to program that in BASIC. I could nice. make like two lasers connect and all sorts of fun stuff happen. But like when it had to get serious, I was like, wow. Hey, let me go find something else to do. <laughs> have you guys checked the uh, web comic commit strip commit from like when you do a commit and git? It's called commit strip. They have uh, one. Huh. One of their uh, cartoons is uh, they have several pictures. Coder, he writes code. Software engineer, he writes code. DevOps, well, he writes code. Lead developer, he writes code. Uh, you have engineer, he writes code. And then you have sysadmin. Hey, hmm, this looks really cool. And he has a box of, uh, of donuts. Right now, anything you want to do in, in IT, having that ability to code, comes in so very handy and it comes in even if you're not writing a program it comes in in automation right so, now we cannot be uh, a master of one single trade almost everybody ends up being a jack of all trades and dealing with several systems linux windows uh embedded devices uh you need to talk with amazon you need to talk with Azure, and just being able to automate a bunch of tools Comes in super handy, super yeah, and useful. You should totally use Python for all that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, well, Carlos, so well, me... hold on. Along the lines of what uh, programmers are, I want to read a quote and I want you to tell me where this came from. Uh, coders yeah. fall into one of four categories young adolescents, college students, professionals, or mature, unreformed ex virus writers. But our target is professional, which puts him in the early 20s to mid 40s. Where did they come from? I don't know. <laughs> CSI Cyber. Uh, I knew it was going to be a television show. Uh, ne <laughs> never seen the show. Yeah. Well, it's gotten better, Carlos. I, you, better it's than gotten that better. It's over? You it haven't end? even no. watched the first, Dr. Yeah. Google or uh, Walking Dead or any of that stuff. I, I really wish I had time to watch it. You TV. should. You should take a break from coding, Carlos. And Relax your brain for a little while and watch a mindless show. Kids. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so, guys, listen. Maybe this this is something oh. I'll, I'll try to follow up on. But <coughs> Sorry. So, somebody should learn how to code. They can choose their language. Uh, they can either go structured or unstructured. They should look for port enumeration. And how will they know? How, how do they know they got it right? How did you it's, change my topic? You totally changed my topic, Mike. <laughs> I was looking for tools. I know. I'm just busting your techniques. balls. I, 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 I this is security deathmatch, all right? You changed my topic. I'm very upset. Where's my tool, battle axe? I walked, I walked into the cage, man. This is <laughs> what you get. If, 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 have, another, say, have another if, Santar can jello <laughs> shot. Okay, maybe I, I will. I would say if you're a good sysadmin and you go into a box, either you're a pen tester or a defender, everything in that box is a tool that you have for you to, to kind of use. It's, it, it's just like being in a gunfight and all of a sudden you go into a room and it's an armory. You have a bunch of stuff you can choose to, and you can choose, choose whatever you need for the moment. If you're good at, at, at being a sysadmin, you have half the battle kind of won. In my can opinion, napkins back up? You can choose whatever you want from that system, which oh. also comes to scripting, either in Python or Python. Or so, <laughs> so, Mike, you asked before... Uh, like what tool people should use yeah. um, in their environment that's free. And I'm going to give Chris props because I used, uh, well, we use now Nagios. And you may not think of Nagios as a security tool, but I really think that it can fall into that category because you can really script mm -hmm. Nagios to do whatever you want. And if you know, I'll give you guys props now, shell scripting. Uh, you can pretty much script Nagios to do whatever you want. To initiate a shell script which means you can make it do anything. We use it for some interesting things here that are not really security related, but once we used it for some of those things, like it checks for duplicate entries uh, in an XML file and sends us a Nagios alert. I'm like, that's such a cool, you I'm like, that is a fantastic framework. I'm like, we could use that for other security things too. Now, I'm not saying it should be the only security tool in your arsenal, but if you can do some security related housekeeping tasks with Nagios, I think that puts you in much better shape, oh. Mike, when you're 
uh, fending off adversaries. It's just knowing your systems are running, doing what they're supposed to be doing, and identifying when they fall out of scope. And that's how we're using it in a lot of just yeah, like different it. circumstances. So. And, 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 and one advantage there, uh, Paul, is that mm -hmm. with Nagios, you also you can actually detect um, anomalies in your network. All of a sudden, you're, you're looking at your graphs in the screen and you're seeing, okay, DNS, oh, typical... Paul goes to Pornhub and Clip Hunter and Pretty much. Well, X videos or whatever else he <laughs> tends to go to. Um, all of them are A, C name, one or two CRV records, and all of a sudden in one day you have a bunch of TXT records. Huh, this is not normal. What is happening here? And, and you can go in and see that somebody's using, let's say, Cabal Beacon going through DNS in your network. Uh, Finding those anomalies, being so familiar with your environment, and those graphs can actually make it visual so it's easier to understand when something doesn't fit right in the way the environment works. Absolutely. All right, All right one, Mike, one you, you go ahead. I'm going to let you steer us off into a different direction now, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> favorite, favorite tool oh, I thought they were going to use another word that began with F. Okay, sorry, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Feelings? Feeling. Yes. <laughs> I have none. Uh, favorite tool for wireless? Something maybe I could, uh, I, I would be able to put on, on one of my non jailbroken devices or on my laptop. So when I'm out and about and somebody goes, I can't get my, I don't know, whatever. Use any use case. I don't want to go illegal with it. But um, favorite <clears throat> wireless tool, troubleshooting, something, whatever. What so I, like? I use oh. the Pony Express Pone Phone for all of my wireless security. <laughs> huh. Was that too corny? <laughs> I would I would say oh. Kismet. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, the reason Still. I mentioned Pony Express because I like having the an external tablet or device to run that stuff, so I can put a different wireless adapter or a different antenna. I don't have to mess with the laptop I'm using to, you know, check my email and do all that other stuff. So I can maintain my wireless connection to look things up on the internet, communicate with people. Then I've got the separate device that's actually doing the wireless. Mon and, it, you know, I, w I say Pony Express because they're a sponsor and all, but there's lots of different devices that will separate that out for oh, you. Absolutely. Kismet and AeroDump are probably my two favorite tools. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing that, it all comes down to the actual wireless driver, the, the USB device or antenna that you're using. That's always the hardest part to huh. get over. Okay. You've got to find yeah. something that does monitor mode and, or, or even better, packet injection. I have to agree. Kismet and if not Kismet... There's one that I use on OS 10 called uh, Wi-Fi Explorer, which is really nice. If you have an Android phone, Wi-Fi Analyzer is a fantastic tool. Completely free. You don't need to jailbreak it. It's a oh, really, yeah. really easy way what, to do a Whatever survey. happened to Kismac? I think it's, it's uh, still, around. still around. Yeah. That was a good one for OS 10. It's been a very long time. Mm. But that's, the that's the throwback tool of the week. Oh, there you go. Well, it's Throwback Thursday. I, I have another throwback tool. That, that was the one with a platypus. I think so. Dressed up like yeah. a, yeah. a net, net, net BSD demon. <clears throat> yeah. On the, on the exact flip side of, of wireless site survey tools, a tool I've been actually going back to uh, a lot quite recently is mm. a tool called NetDiscover, which is passive ARP traffic monitors to map mm. a network. Yeah. It is just a great lightweight tool for walking into an environment you don't know you are. Fire up Net Discovery and it'll give you a nice lay of the land, IP address, MAC, OUI lookup of the, the vendor if nice. it's there. Nice. And, 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 and since we're mentioning basic tools. Basic, but this is where the whole conversation came from. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the king of tools, Wirechark. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because I was kind of surprised it didn't come up. I use, uh, the, the thing is, I use it so much daily for reverse engineering work that I kind of missed it. Uh, when you mentioned wireless, I forgot that you can actually. If you have the right nick, you can actually use it also in wireless. But boy, do I parse too many pickups in the day. <laughs> All righty. Uh, let's go on to transition to some non-technical topics. I guess these are still technical, but uh, not as technical. So tech light topic. Is vulnerability scoring useful? How do you or should you use vulnerability scoring slash severity to manage and prioritize risk in your environment. I just gave a talk on, and I, I talked about this, so I kind of want to open it up to everyone else and kind of get your feelings and thoughts on, uh, on that as soon as I tell you a quick story about when I was talking about this in my presentation. So I'm here, I am at Source, uh, not Source, B-Sides Boston. I'm giving my presentation, 
and I start talking about CVSS scoring and CVE. And I say, you know, we assign arbitrary, well, not arbitrary, but we assign severity levels, CVE assigns, I should say, severity levels to a particular vulnerability. And I said, you know, it's really not, <coughs> excuse me, applicable to you because that is the score of the vulnerability itself, yeah. not the conditions that exist inside of your environment. And I said, yeah. the CVE scoring and CVSS scoring, I said, I don't want to say it's useless. And I'm like, you know, I'm like Steve Christie is here today. I saw him walking around. I'm like, he's like the curator of CVE. And I really hope he's, I'm like, Steve, are you here? And as I was talking about Steve, Steve walks into my talk, like literally on cue, in walks Steve. And I'm like, uh, so yeah, we were talking about CVE and how great it was. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Like he couldn't, have, it was not planned. I did not conspire with Steve before that happened. If you watch the video, which is posted to the securityweekly.com website, you can actually see as Steve walks into the talk. It was perfect. Well, and uh, and after the talk, Steve was like, you know, so you were talking about CVEs. Like, so what, what were you saying? What were you saying, huh? <laughs> so I got the Inquisition afterwards. It's pretty funny. Listen, man, I, I watched that video. I, I thought you did a great job. I well, paid you the you. compliment in private, but since you gave out my I was sick story, I, uh, I think <laughs> it, was, it was worth watching. No, I, 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 I enjoyed it. You've got a fantastic uh, presentation ability about you, and uh, I learned a few things, so it was good. Well, I figured out <clears throat> as long as there are funny images on the screen behind me, people will laugh. <laughs> Or not, mm. when you're, or when you're they're not done. laughing at or the not. screen. But yeah, okay. Or not. Or they could be hey, laughing look, at me. They could, I, that could be true, People might too. be laughing at you, with you, or near you. It's there is, there was good. one picture where no one laughed. I have to go back and pull that slide out. <laughs> <So whatever, laughs> not not all of them could be funny. Field tested. Space well, Road gives I, me crap about that. He's like, that one wasn't funny, dude. I'm like, at, at, I'll rip that one out. Okay. At the risk of us all kind of agreeing, look, I, the last time I came into really looking at the vulnerability scoring, uh, and this is like in the last year, I had somebody come to me, they were very excited, they had just built this dashboard, and they said, look, oh, this is this is our dashboard, and we're gonna show this to management, and, and they said, okay, so we scanned these five servers, and we've got you know 15,000 vulnerabilities, and 5,000 are critical, and look, they're all red, and so they're very excited, they had these numbers, these big numbers, and they're red, and I looked at them and I said, what the hell is that based on? And they said, well, it's based on the, the vulnerability score. And I said, is it based on what matters to, to this organization? No. Do you know if those servers are important? Where, where do they rank in terms of priority? I, I don't know. Mm. Okay, of the thousands of vulnerabilities now that you have uncovered, how, I mean, you told me it's across you know, these five servers or, or whatnot. How many patches to fix those? I got no idea. How long will that take? I'm not really sure. What's the actual damage somebody would do if they exploited any of those on the server? <laughs> or are Good they question. Even, are they even exploitable? Are they yeah, being well, actively exploited? Well, that was my next question. Yeah. yeah, based on what you guys know, do we have protections in front of it? Oh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really sure. I said, so just so we're clear, you're going to run with this. You're going to say it's a high vulnerability. You're going to take that to a bunch of executives, and you're going to say, you guys asked for a dashboard. I'm giving you a dashboard. Look, it's red, red, red. But you can't tell me any of the impact relative to my local environment. I'm like, guys, I, I don't mean to, I, I know you're working hard on this. I don't, I'm sorry, this isn't, this isn't going to be very useful. So um, I get it. I, but it's really hard, Mike, to say, yeah. I've got 20,000 systems in my environment and they run 100,000 different services and there's thousands of different applications and there's three different classifications of data spread across those 20,000 systems. How do I even begin to prioritize that? And that's really what you need to start doing is figuring out where your most sensitive data lives yeah. and then identifying those systems and then presenting to management that says, yeah, we've got 150,000 vulnerabilities, but we've got these critical systems and that's limited to 1,000 vulnerabilities. And of those 1,000 vulnerabilities, they've got... Uh, 500 exploitable vulnerabilities, and oh, by the way, 50 of those are exploited by malware, and I really need help getting the right resources to my 
respective systems administration teams to get those problems fixed right away. Yeah, keep, keeping in mind, right, the, the, the corollary to that is, oh, but we're also running this custom software which prevents us from applying these three patches, so we need to do X, right? I mean, like, there's, there's, there's always, there's, it's never yeah. as straightforward as that. What's interesting, and this, is, this to me still feels very much on topic is, so what we're saying is if vulnerability scoring isn't as useful as we'd like it to be, then I feel that we're at a place in security right now where we're dogmatically clinging to stuff because it's the way that we've always done it. And so I know uh, I know that if I say big data or machine learning, we're supposed to take a big drink. So we won't say that. But but here's one of the things I do now when I catch these briefings. Can we, we're taking big drinks anyway. <laughs> go ahead. T take your take your big drink. <laughs> uh, when when somebody gives me the briefing and they say, oh, we're going to help you prioritize it, right? I mean, it's we good. keep talking yeah. in this industry about prevention, prevention, prevention. Okay, prevention is still important, but what's our capacity to detect? And really what we're talking about is how how effective is your detection and how does it guide response? People go, oh, we'll help you prioritize. And I always say, what are you prioritizing against? What I'm starting to see is some <coughs> vendors are either they, – they claim they do it. I have yet to see it in the field. Uh, or they're at least moving towards saying, you know what, we're going to start looking at your systems, we're going to start profiling them, and we're going to actually start coming back to you. So if we say you have this particular vulnerability and we think it's high, it's because A, we see somebody in the wild is exploiting it, B, you have it on your system, C, these are your high priority systems, and D, we've looked at your other tools and, and someone would be able to exploit this and it would be harder for you to see. Like they're actually starting to look at the totality of your solution and give you something that's actually useful. So when we say we don't have enough people, right, if we go to the old methods, but gosh, if this isn't, it, I think maybe the way to ask this question is, is vulnerability, is vulnerability scoring as we do it today useful? Eh, can we get better at it? Yeah, I think we'd better. So I I don't know I I'm kind of on the fence about I have it's a death match uh, son get in there that's it <laughs> I have this vulnerability and I can't patch it but it's really critical therefore well, hold on. does it have a logo because if it doesn't have a logo that's it's right. not actually does it have critical. a logo does it have a name let's let's take that name off the software? table let's say it's a really critical vulnerability <laughs> remote exploitation it's being actively exploited by malware the whole nine yards it's as critical okay. as it can get and. I've got some on a system that I can't patch, and I've got some compensating control. I, your score has to take into account how easy or difficult it is for that compensating control to be bypassed. Like, how well does that compensating control work? The fact is the vulnerability still exists, and if someone were pro to progress yeah. to the point where they could see it, it would still be there. So the, it's, it's kind of like... You know, it's a good point. I've got a lot of. Yeah, I, and, I hate the medical analogy, but it's kind of like you know, uh, and this was on an episode of CSI Cyber, right? <laughs> the medications that they were buying online that were fake had a little bit of uh, painkiller in them, so the people thought they were getting better, but the underlying illness was still there. And again, I hate the medical analogies, but that's this analogy, right? Oh. You're still dying on the inside from these vulnerabilities. But you've just got this, you know, other compensating control that's, that's making you feel good about it. And I, 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 think, I still think you're going to die, is my point. Well, it, it, isn't it kind of like the same thing we kind of discussed last time I was in the podcast? Uh, where we were trying. Ago. It was only two weeks, and last week I was waiting for you guys to call. I texted you, and nobody called me. I was with my headset and everything in Skype waiting. <clears throat> I blame Nick. Okay. Um... <laughs> So uh, we were trying to kind of find what is the, this rule that we have to find. And we came to the conclusion that there's no one-site-fits-all type solution when it comes to security. And I think it applies to all areas, even vulnerability scoring, monitoring, incident response, pen testing, whatever you call it. There's no one-size-fits-all or no one magical tool. Every environment is completely different. Everybody behaves differently. Yeah, and you know what? I, I completely agree with that. Um, one of the things I'm starting to look at, though, and, and I think this does matter with vulnerability scoring, is we have to figure out then a way to be able to talk about things consistently and then apply them individually, right? It's the difference between competencies and performance modeling. I, I don't <laughs> mind the idea of, of a vulnerability score as long as that's the score of the vulnerability, and then there's got to be like a you know application. Uh, no, what's not and, called and, and there we can an start environment with, score. What, what or is something. the process? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. because you can do that. It's, right. it's it, it takes work. Point. Actually, Risk IO is, I mean, I hate to name vendors on the show sometimes, but exactly what you're talking about, Mike, is like what vendors like Risk IO are trying to accomplish is to, you are actually providing some of that context to them. But it's a lot of work. You know, the, the kind of, the, the downside of that is not only do I have all these vulnerabilities to worry about, but I have to provide them all with this context. And it's difficult to automatically discover that context. Right. And, and but so vulnerability management is hard. I mean, that was one of the points from my talk, right? You know, yeah. you brought, is hard. You brought mm -hmm. up a very another interesting point during that, that presentation that uh, we, we focus so much time on the red. Yeah. The, the, the shiny dashboard, going to management, all of the high vulnerabilities when we forget about the blues, the lows. And those those are, can be just as impactful to your organization if you have a skilled attacker or Absolutely. someone who's persistent. We're focusing only on red while you leave blues for years at a time because it's low priority. We have a lot to deal with. Volume management's hard. Yeah. Forget about all the other yeah. ones. Just fix the high ones. Fix that. You can't do that. You can't. And, 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 and you know what I see every time I see a bunch of blue and, and yellow? I see, are your sysadmins trained? Do you have a configuration management system in place? How are you managing patches and making sure that every, every, every machine is configured properly? It, and it boils down to processes. Are you following the basics? Because once you have the basics, it doesn't matter if your environment is a uh, telco or it's a uh, hospital or whatever. Everybody needs to make sure everything's configured properly, patch and monitor it. And there are some basics that we can talk about which will apply to all of those, even though they might have different needs and uses. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> we'll come back to that topic. It's an important one. I want to talk about privacy. You um, have none. Get over it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I talked, we, we talked briefly last week where you can go into your iPhone and go into your location history and it tells you all the places that you've been. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do that with a lot of services. A lot of Google. Google, phones. Google yeah. will show you that. So, I mean, uh, so <sighs> my wife gave my, her phone to our two-year-old son in the supermarket. And he was bored. He was like, ah, this phone's not really doing it for me. It might be more fun for me to launch it and see it break and see mommy's reaction to that. And he tested that theory. So my wife had to get a new iPhone. And so I, you know, I, so it, and she got a new laptop. So I've been doing the whole transition, which is a complete <laughs> friggin' pain in the ass. I mean, she needed a new laptop. So uh, now she's got a new phone, new laptop. And I've been cutting all that over, but iOS I, I asks you all these questions, right? Do you want to use uh, Find My Phone? Do I want to use iCloud? Do I want to back up all my pictures to iCloud? And I'm kind of like, my gut reaction is no, no, I don't, I don't want all that. That seems like a huge privacy violation. Um, what, are, what are you guys' thoughts on the privacy as it relates to some of these Find My iPhone? Using iCloud for to back up all your contacts and storage um, and pictures. Like, what are your thoughts on that? My wife plays a Zigbee to uh, token on me, so she knows where I'm you are all the time. <laughs> yeah, she knows uh, uh, through the home automation system. She knows as soon as I leave the door, I go out. She goes like, "Huh, Carlos left home." Oh, you huh, have one of those. Uh, is it a smart huh. things? The little tag on on smart the, things. The smart the yeah. presence sensor. Yeah. Yeah. I put one of those oh. in my in my kid's backpack. I think he threw it in the woods or something. <laughs> yeah. Smart uh, so, kid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, uh, um, there's a balance that we have not achieved, and the thing is that we also have to take into account we're not normal people. <laughs> we true. are. We get so any true. gadget that there's out there, and we'll try any service at least once to play with. So we're not normal people. But when we talk about, let's say, Twitter, Facebook, I think people are starting to learn the um, consequences. They're getting bitten by it, uh, and I was surprised. Uh, my wife drags me to church every Sunday with her so I can watch over the kids while she talks about things I don't agree with. Uh, but um, and, I, and I was surprised that the last time she kind of told the pastor, hey, my husband's a hacker. He can talk to you about this security stuff. I go, like, oh, crap. And I start talking with a lot of the people over there. 
normal people. And, and one of the things that surprised me is how many people actually have been bitten by putting pictures and making comments in Twitter and Facebook and tagging, oh, I'm here and weren't you supposed to be at work? Oh, you're fired. Oh, let's have a chat at work and this will affect your review. People are starting to kind of learn because they're starting to get bitten by it. Yeah. Which actually surprised me <clears throat> because before when we talk about privacy, people didn't care. At least teenagers don't. But when you start talking with older people, especially those who are kind of living leaving college and going to the workforce and now are finding that HR departments are actually Googling your yes. info and Googling you and that, and your it, boss and goes that on, is having an effect. Your boss goes on your Facebook page. Have you ever seen those, uh, the yeah. posts on Facebook about people who have posted on Facebook and lost their jobs? Yeah. Why Just, do you think I never rant about work anymore in Twitter? Because no way, man. Half the VPs follow me in Twitter from work. And I'm like, oh, crap. That and I love my job, so I have nothing to complain about. <laughs> Just saying. That's not what you say via IM. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the IM chats are encrypted, okay? <laughs> are they? Yeah, so, well, Kevin, so what's your take on, well, first the phone stuff. Like, I want to know your take on the, the uh, specifically the iPhone stuff, because that's the, what I just experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I kind of disable on my wife's phone and my phone is like all those find my iPhone, iCloud services. And then, you know, what Carl's talking about is, is kind of going off into it's, social media as it's well. It's kind of a, a cost-benefit analysis. I mean, find my iPhone. That's great. You lose your iPhone. You have a service that will find it for you. You can use it as a remote wiping tool. It, it, it has a lot of great applications that what you give away is having a phone that's constantly calling back to a server you don't control. So it, it kind of compromises your privacy, but... It protects your privacy on the same token because if someone steals my phone, I can remotely exactly, wipe it. Exactly, but there's also kind of catch-22 there where let's say you're not using iCloud, you're not using Find My iPhone, your phone itself, all those applications are pulling all that same location information. They can pull cell phone towers and do uh, trilateralization, figure out where you are. If my phone's on and I have it, people know where I am, basically. Yeah, and, but and, and, and if you even want simpler, I remember I have a friend called Bob that actually has done work for several government agencies part-time uh, and he has seen what kind of data you can get from uh, pen letters uh, submitted to telcos and how they feed that data into uh, certain software that they buy from a South African company and boy can they get a lot of info from you just from telco so it doesn't matter if you have an Android doesn't matter if you have yep. an iPhone as long as you're connected, you can be tracked and people can make associations based on your metadata. Oh, yeah. I mean, at, you're, you're talking about you're a walking device that whose sole purpose is to, tr to track you. That's how cells work. It's, it's, a, it's, it's it by design to figure out what these devices are. So if you're law enforcement or fed, you have the, the, the tools to access all that. But it gets a lot more hairy when you start thinking about applications that you install on your phone. Uh, Uber is a good example of this where they just got caught recently uh, publicly stating that they can see where everybody is at all times on a global view because the application itself can pull the cell phone towers and do wireless site surveys and figure out where the actual phone yeah. is. And, well, because that they have to match a driver with someone who needs a ride. But you don't even right? have to have be using the application. The, the application runs can in the run background. in the background. And, and, and they started gathering information. What apps are you running? Exactly. Um, so, I, I how, mean, how, how many times do you use that app? Android is notorious for having awful permissions on their phone where install a flashlight app. Why does it need to know GPS? Why does it need to know my, my contacts or access my SMS? I feel like backgrounding in Android is better than in iOS, too. I feel like the apps do more in the background and yeah. have more freedom it, when they run it, in the background it, it, than it, it, it all was. depends on your risk matrix. To who do you want to stay private from? Is yeah. it your wife? Is it cops? Is it the government? Is it your boss? It all depends what level of privacy against who do you, what you want to keep private from who. You know, what um, really, you know what really grinds my gears kind of along those lines, Carlos, is the people that uh -huh. don't have Facebook that should have Facebook. The people that, like, text you links to YouTube videos or, like, show you the YouTube video when you're with them, it's like, <laughs> dude, you should just have Facebook. 
And they don't. They don't. They don't want to use Facebook. But if they want, to, well, what if I don't want to use Facebook? Are you going to? You don't, you're one of those non-Facebook users. Are you going to kick me out? I, I know that you're the, one of those non-Facebook users, aren't you? I'll confirm but nor deny yeah. if I have. A <laughs> you're Facebook so account. private, and you keep quiet over there, Chris, because I know you don't have Facebook. <laughs> but you're so private, you don't want to tell me if you have Facebook or not. But and if, if you I, do, you're probably someone different on Facebook. But if, I, if, I don't, if, in fact, for many years, my wife was the one managing my Facebook account. She actually created it for me. I gave Chris one of my Facebook accounts, too. I felt bad. He needed to have a Facebook presence. But, but you don't, you're not one of the ones <laughs> who will text me and be like, hey, check out this video, Paul. It's really funny. These cats are doing weird things, right? Well, no, but now I'm going to start. Now you're going <laughs> to. So here's the, here's the flip side of the question. When we give up that privacy, what are you getting in return, right? So we, we've talked a little bit about some of the, the iPhone stuff, but if you've used Waze, that's a phenomenal tool. I mean, I don't even use a, G, a, G, a standalone GPS unit anymore because I, I enjoy that. You know, I try to be selective about the things that I'll put on social media or the things that I'll, I'll do with my iPhone. But, you know, here's the reality of it. That not only can they actually do the triangulation, right? We've already talked about the stingrays on this site and the number of, of municipalities that have it. If you've got a cell phone, you're being tracked. If you use a credit card or any sort of payment card, you're being tracked. So, like, on one hand, I look at it and I go, man, to really get off the grid in this society, it's getting harder and harder and harder. So, you know, what mm -hmm. I'm starting to look at is the question of is it privacy or is it – are we now – It's are we now moving to the place where – we need to start asking better questions about who's collecting the data, what are they doing with the data, and what limits can or should we put on them. And I don't mean government. I just mean what what, what do we expect from them? Because, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw this, but the, some of the credit card companies now, are, or the, the larger brands are saying, you know what, we're going to test the program where if you've linked your credit card to your, uh, uh, to, we'll put an app on your phone, we'll know where you are. So we're not going to bother you with these fraud alerts anymore and these fraud holds because if we see that your phone is with your credit card and it's within an area that you normally travel, we're good with it. We're going to say it's okay. So I've polled people. Security people typically go, dude, no way. I'm not using that. You ask the average consumer, mm -hmm. is that a benefit to you? And they go, wait, so you're not going to freeze my account? You're not going to make me call in? You're not going to do this crazy crap from me? Yeah, dude, I'm in. I'm totally, I love that. Well, that's Mike, awesome. You hit, a, you hit a great point. It's hour. convenience. And, and that's why... When someone doesn't have Facebook, that's why I want them to have Facebook, so I can conveniently message them, look at their photos. We can right. look at each other's photos. It's convenience. And for that convenience, you're not only sacrificing security, but you're sacrificing some privacy, too. And I think that's really the crux of the whole issue. But to go back to, to, to the original point, we're different in the sense that we look we at are, these applications we are different. from a very different perspective than an average user, where a service it means their life is more convenient. Well, we start asking the question, well, what are they doing with this information? Right. So, of course, we're right. going to freak out about it. But, you know, at the end of the day, if someone doesn't get locked out of their credit card, that's awesome. I think it's freaky that when I go to the Security Weekly site, which has some Google ads on it, there are always sites that I've – Right. Like that, like that I like. There's always stuff that I – I can identify or, or with places me. you've been recently. Yeah, uh, I'm like stuff like that. That's yeah. creepy. You're the product, man. It's creepy. Dude, it's, it, 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 I, I, I was laughing the other day when I brought up a, uh, a website, and all of a sudden, all of the ads were either from quadcopter drones or guns. I <laughs> went like, huh. I'm totally hanging this out with scary. you, Carlos. <laughs> I'm coming down. This is scary. <laughs> the the amount of the, and, and the funny <clears> thing is. I started moving from site to site and disabled my, uh, my, my, my app blocker and was going like, damn, they're very accurate. They do know me. They do know me quite well. It's unbelievable the amount of flashlight ads I get. I don't know what. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> Never mind. You keep buying your fire. Huh? <laughs> Got, now I moved over to Phoenix. They're a lot cheaper and quite good. Oh, anyway, with that, um, we're going to take a short break, <laughs> and after that, we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about the security news for this week, which has to include Venom. Oh, God. Yes. Oh, God. We're talking about the name vulnerability. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> 